Warning, this program will discuss adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. See, the problem when you let a salesman introduce you is that it gives you too much to live up to, but thank you very much for that. In our uh, local meetings here in Philadelphia, when we're finished, we of course conclude the meeting by praying the Memorare, and I think that's pretty much standard in most of our chapters. Uh, and then we add a, a little litany of the saints, um, all of them having something to do with our mission and uh, with the, the reason that we're gathering. We have uh, some who are martyrs for chastity, like St. John the Baptist, who was killed because he criticized the, the marriage arrangements of King Herod, or St. Maria Goretti. Uh, we know her story. She, she died rather than give in to the advances of her neighbor. Um, we call on St. Augustine, who famously struggled to be chaste, uh, and also his mother, St. Monica, whose prayers uh, led him, uh, with, by God's grace, to conversion. Uh, we even include uh, Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati, yeah. who as a young man became a model of chastity, holy friendships, and authentic masculinity. There's one name in the litany that will be familiar to all of you, but has always uh, kind of intrigued me since I got involved with Courage some years ago, and that's the name of St. Charles Luanga. We call on St. Charles and his companions uh, because they are the patron saints of the Courage Apostolate, but you know, asking around, no one seemed to know too much about them or why they were connected, other than a passing reference in their biography that they endured martyrdom rather than give in to the homosexual desires of the king whom they served. So I decided a short time ago to, to read up on them and to see what I could find out. And what I learned was much more than I expected and impressed me very much. Uh, so I thought it would be a good thing to share with all of us uh, to get to know our, our patron saints in, in this apostle a little bit better. Uh, the 22 Catholic martyrs of Uganda, some of them as young as 14 or 16 years old, uh, give an impressive witness to faith, charity, chastity, and so many other virtues. So I, I learned their stories, I was impressed by them, and then I realized that this is the 50th anniversary of their canonization, a, a golden jubilee for these wonderful saints. Uh, so we take this opportunity to just learn a little bit more about them so that we can imitate them uh, more effectively. The story begins in the kingdom of Buganda, one of the most ancient and populous parts of what is now the nation of Uganda in East Africa to the, the northeast of Rwanda, what we were talking about yesterday. The first Europeans to arrive there were the British explorers John Hanning Speak and James Augustus Grant, who were searching for the source of the Nile River. When they arrived in the capital of the kingdom called Rubaga in 1862, they found an impressively organized society with many clans and local chiefs centered around the king known as the Kabaka and his court. Kabaka Mutesa I made quite an impression on these English visitors. Very tall and dignified, Mutesa was also exceptionally intelligent. His royal name means he who is wise in counsel. He was apparently well loved by his subjects and was obeyed without hesitation. Of course, this was not just because of their love for him, but because in the tradition and law of the kingdom, the Kabaka ruled as an absolute, tyrant, uh, absolute monarch, and it was forbidden to question the king's commands. Disobedience was, published, was punished quickly, usually by swift and very public execution. The second most powerful man in the kingdom was a sort of combination chancellor and prime minister known as the Katikiro. The royal family included dozens of wives and literally scores of children, and the royal household was served by countless ministers and assistants, including hundreds of royal pages, young men who served in the king's uh, chambers and in the audience hall, and were overseen by the major domo of the palace. The native religion of Buganda, here we see uh, the capital city, Rubaga, was monotheistic. They worshiped God under various titles, including the Master, the Lord of Heaven, and Katonda, which means the Creator. Daily blessings on one's family and household formed an important part of, the, of re their religious life, as well as the veneration of ancestors. Around the 16th century, immigrants to the kingdom from some of Buganda's neighbors brought with them the worship of several pagan gods along with prophets and mediums who insinuated themselves into the royal court. 
In the late 1850s, Arab traders made their way from the eastern coast of the continent of Africa to the court of Kabaka Mutesa, bringing the religion of Islam with them. Mutesa gave them a warm welcome, but never converted to Islam. The English explorers who arrived in the 1860s explained Christianity to Mutesa, and with his consent, they wrote back to England seeking missionaries to come to the kingdom. The first cohort of Anglicans from the Church Missionary Society arrived in Rubaga at the end of June 1877. They were joined about a year and a half later by four members of the Society of Missionaries of Our Lady of the African Missions, which had been founded in Algeria and was commonly known as the White Fathers. Father Leon Livinac, later vicar apostolic to the region and superior general of his order, led this little group. He was accompanied by Father Ludovic Giraud, Father Leo Barbeau, and Father Simeon Lordel, who traveled on ahead of the group and was the first to arrive in the kingdom. Kabaka Mutesa seemed to enjoy listening to Père Lordel, whom he, also, whom he often referred to as Ma Pera, his version of Mon Père, French for my father. He often took particular delight in pitting Father Lordell against Alexander Mackay, the Presbyterian minister at the head of the group of British missionaries, asking them both to explain a point of doctrine and often telling Mackay that he wished to be baptized by Mapera. In truth, however, Mutesa's main concern was always the security of his kingdom and the safety of his people, and political concerns usually took precedence over religious ones. He would appear to be moving closer to the Catholic missionaries, then he'd kind of go over to the Protestants, then he seemed to be going with the Muslims and kind of go back and forth, all depending on which uh, empire power, French, British, Turkish, he thought was most likely to endanger his kingdom. In the end, Mutesa never converted to Christianity or Islam, but he did allow the French fathers to evangelize in his kingdom, and they began in Rubaga. Eventually, the Kabaka imposed one important restriction. They were to limit their teaching and evangelizing to the members of his own household. This was presumably intended to keep them under supervision and on a short leash so that the king could step in to curtail things if it seemed to be getting out of hand. In reality, the boys and young men who served as pages and servants in the royal palace had become very intrigued by the discussions they observed and overheard between the king and Father Lordell. When it became clear to them that Mutesa couldn't decide between the religions, that he didn't have all the answers in this part of life, they sensed that it must have been a very important matter to have gotten the best of their all-powerful king. Once the permission was given, they quickly went to the fathers to be instructed in the faith. Four catechumens were enrolled together in 1880 and baptized in April and May 1882. They were important adult servants of the king and would later become leaders among the, the Catholics in Rubaga and among the martyrs. The first two served directly in the king's household. Joseph Mukasa was about 14 years old when he first went to serve as a page in the royal palace. He quickly impressed the major domo of the palace who arranged for him to serve in the Kabaka's private apartments. When he enrolled as a catechumen, Joseph was about 20 and he was baptized by Father Lordell in April 1882. Joseph's best friend was Andrew Kagwa, who was about five years older than Joseph. As a boy, Andrew, then a Muslim, had been captured as a slave from one of Buganda's neighboring territories. He was brought to serve in the palace, where his cheerful disposition made him very popular among the royal pages. When European explorers brought Western-style drums to the court, Mutesa had several of his pages, including Andrew, take lessons to learn how to play them. Andrew was about 25 when he was received as a catechumen, and he and Joseph were baptized on the same day. Around the same time, Andrew was promoted to the post of Mugoa, master of the king's household military band. The other two of the first catechumens served one of the king's closest counselors, the county chief of Singo, which was a 12-hour journey on foot from Rubaga. Matthias Kalemba was captured as a small child and sold to the chief of Singo. Growing up in the chief's household, though, he became a beloved part of the family and was entrusted with greater and greater responsibilities. As a young man, he was put in charge of the chief's household service, all the people that worked in the home, and he was granted the title Mulumba, the overseer. It was the traditional responsibility of the chief of Singo to build and repair the dwellings in the royal palace, 
And so Matthias came into contact with the White Fathers when he went to Rubaga to oversee the construction of homes for them. He was about 45 years old at the time. Matthias was baptized on the same day in May 1882 as Luke Banabakintu, another servant of the chief of Singo. He lived on a little property given to him by the chief a short distance away and was responsible for supervising the servants who lived outside of the chief's compound. He heard, about his faith, uh, he heard about the Catholic faith from his friend, the Malumba, and the two of them took instructions together. Once they were baptized, these four distinguished men assist the fathers in preparing others to receive the faith, and two centers of evangelization formed around these little groups. When in 1883, the fathers felt compelled to leave Buganda because of their own ill health as well as threats they had received from the Muslims, uh, our four uh, catechumens had became the de facto leaders of the Catholics in Rubaga and Singo. By this time, there were about 150 Catholics in the royal household in various stages of instruction. Charles Luanga himself entered the service of the chief of Kirwanyi, who lived about 82 miles northwest of Rubaga. When his chief was named chief of Ketesa near Singo, Charles and the rest of the servants accompanied him there. The chief sent frequent gifts of livestock and produce to the, to the king, and the two servants who were entrusted with delivering the gifts had frequent visits with the White Fathers when they were done their business at the palace. Back in Ketesa, these two who were learning Christianity took, upon it them, took it upon themselves to share what they had learned with their fellow servants, including their friend Charles. They had to conduct these lessons in secret, but Charles was greatly impressed by their teaching. In 1884, when he was sent to the capital to serve in the king's household and was appointed overseer of the pages of the great audience hall, he met Joseph Mukesa, and the two of them worked together not only to organize the work of the pages, but also to instruct them in the Catholic faith. Charles was about 24 years old at this time, roughly the same age as Joseph Mukasa. Kabaka Mutesa died in October 1884 and was succeeded by one of his many sons named Mwanga. At the time of his accession to the throne as the 31st Kabaka of Buganda, he was only 18 years old, not much older than most of the pages who served him. Mwanga faced the same situation his father had regarding the European explorers and would-be colonizers, and he shared his father's concern for safeguarding his borders and the lives of his people. However, he did not share his father's political sense or his pr patient prudence. Contemporary reports describe, Muga describe Mwanga as nervous, suspicious, fickle, and prone to outbursts of both passion and rage. As prince, Mwanga had been friendly with the Catholic missionaries and had sent many servants to them for instructions. When they left in 1883, Father Lordell told Mwanga that they would return when he became the king. Father Lordell did return in July 1885, accompanied by Father Giraud and a lay brother, and amid great fanfare, they were met on the road by a dispatch of the king's guards and numerous messengers bearing gifts. They went to the palace where they were greeted with joy by Mwanga himself. Sadly, this good feeling toward the Christians was not to last. Mwanga began to grow hostile toward his Catholic servants, especially toward Joseph Mukasa, spurred on by two influences. The king's second in command, the katakiro or chancellor, who is pictured here on the right, had plotted an unsuccessful coup early in 1885. The king was warned of the plot by Joseph Mukasa, and Mwanga called in the katakiro to tell him he knew all about the plans. The katakiro was humiliated, and dropped to his knees to beg for his life, let alone to be able to keep his job. Mwanga promoted Mukasa to the position of Major Domo, the, the chief servant of the house, and talked openly about making Joseph his next chancellor. To say that the Katakiro held a grudge against Joseph Mukasa would be grossly to understate it. Also, contemporary reports tell us that Mwanga had become deeply involved in homosexual acts with his pages, who, as we mentioned already, were teenagers like himself, about his own age or a few years younger. How much this had to do with actual same-sex attraction and how much with an intoxication with the power and pleasure that were part of being an absolute monarch at the age of 19 is hard to say. Mwanga eventually had 16 wives and fathered at least 10 children. 
At any rate, the Katakuro encouraged him in this activity. While Joseph Mukasa did everything in his power to keep at least the Christian pages away from the king's advances and expressed his disgust with the situation to the king in private. Joseph found himself in open confrontation with the king near the end of 1885. In September of that year, the Anglican bishop James Hannington announced his intention to present himself to the king. Against the advice of his escort, Hannington decided to enter the country not by the lake as usual, but overland through Buganda's western neighbor, Busoga. A pagan prophecy that doom would come to Buganda from Busoga, combined with Mwanga's natural suspicion and paranoia regarding outsiders, and he became convinced that the bishop's arrival was really just a pretext for an invasion by the British. At the urging of the chancellor, Mwanga determined to send his soldiers to intercept the bishop's party and to have the bishop killed if he tried to enter the kingdom overland. When he caught word of it on October 25th, Joseph confronted the king to his face. Your father would never have done this, he said to him. And in the, in, in the presence of several princesses and a number of pages, he spoke his mind openly, something no one would ever have done uh, in, at the time to that absolute monarch. Mwanga was furious and sent him away. On November 11th, Father Lordell went to the king with the Anglican missionaries and begged him not to have Bishop Harrington killed. By that time, it was too late, as it turns out. The bishop and his party had been murdered on October 29th. But the king was furious, enraged, and demanded to know who among his household had informed the missionaries of his plans. He screamed at Lord Dell and threatened to kill all the missionaries. After two hours, he sent him away. Over the next few days, Father Lordell baptized as many of the catechumens as were ready, since he didn't know how long he would be allowed to stay and minister to them. About half of the 22 Catholic martyrs were baptized between November 15th and 17th, 1885. Over the next three days, Mwanga stewed over this confrontation. His grievances against Joseph Mukasa over their past confrontations convinced him that Joseph must have been the traitor in the royal household who had informed the missionaries of his plans. On the evening of November 14th, the king summoned Mukasa and berated him for his supposed disloyalty for most of the night. The next morning, quite shaken, Joseph went down to the Catholic mission where he attended mass and received communion from Father Lordell. Shortly after he returned to his own home, Joseph was summoned to go back to the palace at once. Mwanga had gathered his chiefs and counselors and asked them what he should do about Joseph Mukasa. Spurred on by them, and especially by the chancellor, Mwanga decided to have Joseph put to death. He ordered that he should be burned alive, and the executioners took him out at once to begin building the pyre. Following the king's knowing the king's impetuous nature, they took their time building it, hoping that Mwanga would change his mind and send a messenger to tell them it had been called off. Soon a messenger did arrive, but this messenger was from the chancellor, who sent his servant to make sure that they were going to carry out the sentence. Until the end, Joseph Mukasa showed his concern for his old friend and master. The last words we have from him are both compassionate and stern. Tell Kabaka Mwanga, he said, tell him from me that he has condemned me unjustly, but that I forgive him. However, let him repent, for if he does not, I shall be his accuser before the judgment seat of God. His executioners laid Joseph on the pile of wood and then slit his throat and burned his body to ashes. The first of the Ugandan martyrs died on the morning of November 15, 1885, at the age of 26. Charles Luanga came to the mission to be baptized the next day, and as the supervisor of the pages, he took over Joseph's role as leader of the catechumens in the palace. On the following day, November 17, Luanga canceled all of his court appointments and summoned all of the pages who had served under Mukasa. When they had assembled, he ordered all those who were not praying with the Christian missionaries to come and stand by his side. To his great surprise, of the dozens of pages who were gathered there, only three of them came to stand beside the king. The rest stayed put. Mwanga flew into a rage. I will have you all put to death, he shouted. Their answer was simple, courageous, and loyal. Very well, master. You will have us all put to death. 
Even in the face of his raging threats, the young men remained loyal to their king and steadfast in the faith. They didn't question what he said, but they didn't let it shake them either. That night, even more of the pages went down to the fathers to be baptized. We get a sense of the urgency of the situation from an interesting fact about the young men who were, who were baptized that week in, in November. Adolphe Ludigo, Achilles Kiwanuka, Ambrose Kibuka, Anatoly Kir Kiriguajo. Do you notice anything about their first names, the names from their baptism? People speculate that the necessity to baptize them so quickly meant that the fathers hadn't had time to discuss with them which saints' names they wanted and simply took out the index of saints and started with A, <laughs> baptizing them in alphabetical order. The next few months were a kind of cold war between Mwanga and the Catholic missionaries with the pages caught in the middle. When Father Lordell would come to have an audience with the king, he'd often delay and sometimes outright refuse to meet with him. And Mwanga began to insist that the, that the pages not leave the palace for instructions. In this situation, Charles Longa's role as catechist and leader became even more important. Then in February 1886, fire broke out in the king's palace on the 22nd. And on the 24th of the same month, lightning struck the, the chancellor's house to which the king had moved. Like Nero so many centuries before him, Mwanga let these events, mixed with the lies of his counselors, make him even more suspicious of the Christians. He was even more infuriated when, on the 22nd of May, his half-sister, Prin Princess Clara Nalumansi, who had been baptized a Protestant but later came into the Catholic Church when she married her, her Catholic husband, publicly burned pagan amulets and charms, defying the traditions of her family and her country. All of these events, combined with the attitude of the Christian pages who were increasingly avoiding and outright refusing the sexual advances of the king, had filled the powder keg of anger in the king that was bound to explode before long. The spark that set it off came, in fact, only a few days after his sister's defiance, on May 25, 1886. After the fire in Rubaga, the royal court had moved about six miles to Munyonyo, a royal compound near the coast of Lake Victoria. Because this residence was so much smaller than the main palace, only a relatively small number of pages were in attendance on the king there. On May 25th, the king assembled a hunting party and went down to the lake to hunt for hippopotamus. Expecting that the king would be gone all day, the pages took the opportunity for a rare day off, and many of them went to the Catholic mission to spend time studying the faith with Father Lordell. However, when no hippo was sighted, Mwanga returned early to the palace in a rotten mood. Realizing when he got back that none of the pages were there to look after him, he flew into a rage and demanded to know what had happened. He was particularly annoyed that the young page Wafu, the son of, the, son of the Katakiro and the object of most of Mwanga's sexual attention, was missing. Mwanga was informed that Mwafu had been seen going back to the capital in the company of Dennis Sebuguawo, a Catholic page who had been baptized the day after Joseph Mukasa's death. The Kabaka was furious that, to his mind, the Catholics were trying to steal even Mwafu away from him. Just then, Dennis and Mwafu entered the palace and came running to seek the king's mercy. Dennis admitted that he had taken Mwafu to learn about the Catholic faith. Mwanga immediately took a hunting spear and began to beat Dennis about the head and chest until the shaft of the spear broke off in his hand. He dragged Dennis bodily out to the audience hall and handed him over to the executioners. Dennis was kept in custody overnight, again in hope that, that the execution might be delayed, especially because he was the nephew of the king's chancellor. However, Dennis was taken out into the woods the next morning and stabbed to death. He died on May 26, 1886 at the age of 16. The night that Dennis Sebuguawa was arrested, Charles Luanga gathered together all the pages that were in the royal household. They were terrified, of course, but he strengthened them with courageous words. Several times, he said, the Kabaka has commanded me, has commanded you to apostatize. It seems likely that very shortly he will again order you to forsake your religion. Then you have only to follow me in a group and boldly affirm that you are Christians. That night, Charles baptized five of the pages, four of whom 
Giavira, age 17, Mugaga, 16, Mbaga Tuzinde, 17, and Kazito, only 14, would soon join him as martyrs. Not having access to Father Lordell's Book of Saints, Charles baptized these new Catholics without giving them Christian first names. On the morning of the 26th, Mwanga again summoned all of the pages to his presence. His counselors, especially the Katakiro, had urged him to end the defiance of the Christians once and for all by having them all put to death. When the pages reached the audience hall, they saw that the royal executioners were already there, awaiting the orders of the king. Father Lordell heard what was happening and rushed to Munyonyo, but when he arrived, he was not allowed to enter the palace. Charles Luanga led the pages to the king, and all, they all greeted Mwanga with great respect. This only enraged him further, and he ordered all those who followed the Christian missionaries, as he said, all those who pray, to stand on one side of the room, while the pagans were to remain with him. Among the Christians was Mbaga Tuzinde, the son of the chief executioner, who stood fast even when the chancellor and his family told him to get out of that group. The 19 Christians, 17 Catholics, and two Anglicans were bound hand and foot and marched out to be executed. Father Lordell saw them go by, and he was as astonished as the executioners were at the peaceful, even cheerful attitude that all of the soon-to-be martyrs displayed. Andrew Kagwa, the king's bandmaster, heard of the morning meeting and quickly returned to the palace to admit that he too was a Christian. He was seized along the way and taken to the katakiro, the chancellor, who was still furious that his son Muafu had started to become a Christian. After berating Andrew, the chancellor ordered his execution. He was taken outside behind the chancellor's house, where first his arm and then his head were severed from his body. Then the rest of his body was hacked to pieces, which were scattered around. He was about 30 when he died on the afternoon of May 26th. There were 13 official execution sites in the kingdom, and the pages were ordered to be taken to Namugongo, about 12 miles away. The custom was to execute a prisoner at the beginning of the journey, and again at each major crossroad along the way as a warning to others. Pansian Ngandwe, a palace guard in his late 30s, was the first of this group to die before they left Munyonyo. When the party arrived in the capital, 20-year-old Athanasius Bazukuketa was stabbed to death and hacked to pieces. The prisoners spent the night at Rubaga, and during the next morning's journey, 24-year-old Gonzaga Gonza was speared and beheaded at Lubawo. The prisoners reached Namugongo late on May 27th and were kept in prison there for a week while preparations were made for their execution. Matthias Kalemba, the Malumba, and Luke Banabakintu were serving the county chief of Singo about 40 miles from Munyonyo. When they heard about the events of, at the palace, they started on their way to turn themselves in as Christians, as Andrew Kagwa had done. Like their friend, the two were seized along the way and taken to the house of the chancellor on the 27th of May. The chancellor ordered that Luke be taken to join the others at Namugongo, but he had special cruelty in mind for Matthias. At 10 o'clock on the morning of May 27th, Matthias, now about 50 years old, was taken out along the road to Namugongo, where first his hands, then his arms at the elbows, then his arms at the shoulder, then his feet at the ankles, then his legs at the knees, then his legs at the hip, were cut off one by one after which the skin that remained on his torso was flayed from his body. His head and trunk were left intact, and he was left to die there by the side of the road. Witnesses reported finding him alive two days later, but they were too terrified to be caught near the king's victim to do anything to comfort him. Matthias presumably died the next day, Sunday, May 29th, after three days of agony. When Matthias left Singo, he put Noah Ma Mawagali, a potter, in charge of the estate. The king's legates, looking to loot Matthias's residence, found Noah there on the morning of May 30th. The legate plunged his spear into Noah's back, and he fell grievously wounded. The legates then tied him to a tree, and after inflicting more wounds to draw as much blood as possible, they set the dogs of the village on him. He suffered in agony throughout the day and died on the evening of May 30th, aged 35. Executions at Namagongo were always carried out by burning the condemned alive. 
Pyres were constructed as wooden frames under which the executioners could light controlled fires to make sure that the victims suffered as long as possible. They were wrapped in mats made of reeds, both to constrict their movements and to serve as kindling for the fire. The images here are photographs of models at the modern shrine of the martyrs in Kampala, the capital of Uganda. After a week in prison, the Christians were led out to the pyre early in the morning of June 3rd, 1886, which was Ascension Thursday that year. The head executioner set Charles Luanga aside as his personal victim, while the rest were bound and piled onto the wooden frames. Charles was taken to a similar pile built by the side of the road. Here the executioner set fire to the wood, just under his feet. When they were burned down to charred bones, his legs were burned, and so on, until the fire reached his chest and stopped the beating of his heart. As he lay dying, Charles confronted his executioner. You poor, foolish man. You do not understand what you are saying. You are burning me, but it is as if you were pouring water over my body. I am dying for God's religion. Charles died with the name of Katonda, God the Creator, on his lips. Further up the hill, the same fate awaited the other martyrs. The fires had to be relit twice in order to reduce their bodies completely to ash. In all, 12 Catholic martyrs died on June 3, 1886, as well as at least 14 martyrs who were Anglicans, all of them on the fires at Namugongo. One more martyr bore the hatred of the king, and especially of his chancellor. Jean-Marie Musei, who had served King Mutesa as a page, was well known for his faithfulness and his charity toward those in need. The anger of the king subsided for a while, but by the beginning of 1887, he was more determined than ever to get rid of the Christians. And so at the end of January, uh, Jean-Marie was summoned before the king, to whom he confessed his Catholic faith. He was turned over to the chancellor and never seen again. It is, it is said that he was beheaded on January 27th and his body thrown into a swamp near Rubaga. He was in his early 30s. By the end of 1887, the persecution had ended, but reports sent back to England by the Protestant missionaries increased British support for colonization in the area. In 18, by 1894, Buganda had become a British protectorate. After an ill-conceived declaration of war on the British, Mwanga fled the country in 1897 and was declared deposed. Soon after the deaths of Charles and his companions at Namugongo, the, the French fathers in, in Buganda began to gather evidence from witnesses to the lives of the martyrs and to their execution. They forwarded the testimony to their generalate and then on to Rome to begin the process of canonization. Declared venerable in February 1920, the martyrs were beatified in June of that same year by Pope Benedict XV. The 22 Catholic martyrs of Uganda were canonized at St. Peter's by Pope Paul VI on October 18th 1964. As I said, this is the 50th anniversary of their canonization by Pope Paul VI, who will himself be beatified in St. Peter's on October 19th, the day after the Jubilee of the Martyrs' canonization. During his homily for the canonization mass, Pope Paul VI said, the African martyrs add another page to the martyrology, the church's role of honor, an occasion both of mourning and of joy. This is a page worthy in every way to be added to the annals of that Africa of earlier times to which we, living in the era and being of men of little faith, never expected to be repeated. Who would have thought that in our days we should have witnessed events as heroic and glorious? These African martyrs herald the dawn of a new age. If only the mind of man might be directed not toward persecutions and religious conflicts, but toward a rebirth of Christianity and civilization. The White Fathers dedicated a shrine at the spot of the martyrdom in Namugongo in 1935. In 1969, during the first pastoral visit to Africa ever made by a pope, Paul VI dedicated the cornerstone for a new shrine basilica. The present church remains a place of pilgrimage, receiving several million pilgrims each year, especially at the Martyr's Feast Day at, in, on June the 3rd. So what do we make of a story like this? Mark Twain once famously quipped that the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin had brought misery to millions of boys in the generations since who could never live up to the level of industry and study that Franklin had displayed in his youth. 
when we hear stories of martyrs, we might begin to think that in our own struggles we haven't really done very much at all. And there's some truth in that, I suppose. Uh, the letter to the Hebrews says, in your struggle to avoid sin, remember you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. It's good to be inspired by the martyrs, but we mustn't get discouraged because we don't think we have the same strength that they do. The story of the Ugandan martyrs, I think, is important for us, not just because it's an impressive, heroic, courageous story, but because when we take a look at their lives and even their deaths, I think we can find in them examples for us as we pursue the goals of our apostolate. If courage members know nothing else about the Ugandan martyrs, they know that they incurred the wrath of the king because they wouldn't give in to his demands regarding unchastity. This is very true, as we have seen, especially in terms of the initial fit of rage that took place at the end of May 1886 over the potential conversion of the king's favorite Muafu that set the whole persecution in motion. There's much more to learn, though, from the Ugandan martyrs about the virtue of chastity. Joseph Mukasa and Charles Luanga both watched out for the pages under their authority and protected them from the king's advances. But how did they do this? With patience and with prudence, mixed with a bit of creativity and an adventurous spirit. Joseph knew that it was useless to confront the king. Instead, he learned to read his moods and to know when he would be looking for the youths. Then he invented all sorts of tasks to make sure that when the king came looking, the young pages that Joseph knew he would be looking for were out of the palace on another job. Wanga knew what was going on and was angry, but didn't want to admit that Joseph had gotten the better of him, so he kept quiet. Joseph and Charles were as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves and kept themselves and the boys safe. This advice to know when temptations are coming in order to be prepared for them is every bit as applicable to an individual's personal quest for chastity as it was for the Christians in the Kabakas court. If we react to temptations by getting agitated, by getting angry, all that does sometimes is make the temptation even stronger. If we are able to stay calm, to see things coming, to plan ahead, and above all, to rely on God's grace, then we're victorious in our battle against all sorts of temptations, especially in the area of chastity. The personal example of the martyrs regarding chastity both intrigued and repelled Mwanga. For the longest time, since the, since the reign of his father, King Mutesa, the main objection of the, of the king and his court to Christianity was that if they converted, they would have to give up many of their wives. Right? King Mutesa had, I think, about 60 wives and almost 100 children. And this was a, a kind of an insurmountable obstacle for them. Mwanga admired restraint, though, in people like Matthias Kalemba. Um, he, he, Matthias, when he converted to Christianity, only kept one of his three wives. And it raised all sorts of eyebrows at the king's court. But it, eventually the king began to see the wisdom in it. And again, like King Herod so many millennia before, he was not sure he could follow the teaching, but he liked to hear about it. He would call Père Lordel in and ask him, what's this all about? Is it true that you can only have one wife? Yes, it is. Is it true that, that you're, if you're a Christian, you're not allowed to give in to, to certain of your desires? Yes, it is, Father Lordel said. And Mwanga threw up his hands and said, well, then it's impossible. What you ask is impossible. Father Lordel's response, with the grace of God, nothing is impossible. Strengthened by grace, the Christian can lead a most chaste life. The Christians in Mwanga's court were often referred to, as I mentioned, simply as those who pray. We have already seen how attendance at Mass and the reception of the sacraments played an important role in the lives of the martyrs. We heard how when they knew their arrest and execution might be imminent, the catechumens sought the sacrament of baptism. People like Joseph Mukasa and Jean-Marie Musei made sure to go to Mass and receive communion in preparation for offering their own lives as a sacrifice. The testimony, of these wit uh, the testimony of witnesses to the execution is full of stories of how the martyrs at Namugongo, both in the prison and on the pyre, offered intercessory prayers for one another that all of them might remain steadfast in the faith in the midst of their torments. Not surprisingly, they also offered prayers for their executioners 
and for the king himself. And it didn't stop there. When 25-year-old James Buza Baliawo, a member of the royal band, was taken away, he said to Mwanga as he left the court, goodbye, I'm off to paradise to intercede with God for you. <laughs> you know, an example of prayer like that seems so extraordinary as to be impossible, maybe even made up. But they sang on the way to their execution. They prayed out loud for one another along the way. When one of them started to lag behind, when one of them started to seem to waver, they prayed as a group out loud for one another. As models for our goal of prayer, I don't think we could do much better. The fellowship among the Catholic neophytes was extraordinary and strong enough to sustain them, not only through the ups and downs of Mwanga's moods and whims, but even through the three years that the priests were completely absent from the kingdom. Joseph Mukasa in Rubaga and Matthias Columba in Singo kept the faith of the catechumens intact during those three long years and gave them as much instruction and support as they were able. Charles Mwanga would take this role on himself uh, later in the, uh, when the persecution had started and the pages weren't allowed to leave. They relied on one another for support. They were glad to have the, the assistance of the priests but they knew that in their fellowship with one another, they were able to be strengthened in the faith. They were able to instruct one another about the love that they had received and then to build up that love in their fellowship. A story from, uh, from the journey to Namagongo illustrates the powerful support of friendship that existed among the Catholic pages. When the pages were arrested on May 26th, one of their number was absent because he had already been arrested and was being held in prison. Mukasa Kiriwawanvu had quarreled with his fellow catechumen, Giavira Musoke, a few days before that, and he had struck him in the abdomen with a piece of wood, drawing blood. When the two, men met in, two young men met in prison that night, Mukasa immediately asked Giavira's forgiveness, which was readily given. The two walked side by side all the way to execution. The good example shown by the martyrs, their loyalty to the faith, their cheerfulness on the way to execution, their fervent prayers, even for the king and the other executioners, had an immediate impact on their countrymen. In the second century, Tertullian had remarked that the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. Where persecutions raged and Christians were put to death, there was always a flowering of the faith as a, as a response to the courageous witness that the martyrs had provided. And certainly, this martyr's blood planted a fertile field around Namugongo and the surrounding countryside. People in and out of the court of the Kabaka flocked to the missionaries in Munyonyo and, and, and in Rubaga to receive instruction and baptism. And the church in what was to become Uganda grew exponentially. To this day, the Archdiocese of Kampala, the modern name for Rubaga, serves nearly four million Catholics, more than 40% of the general population. Thinking of Uganda, we might also recall the important role our martyr patrons have in praying for their native land, especially today. The Ugandan parliament passed an anti-homosexuality act earlier this year, which criminalized various homosexual acts, as well as criminalizing providing shelter to homosexual people or, quote, promoting homosexuality. Some offenses, according to the act, carry a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. This is a revision from the original act which ordered the death penalty. Public reaction to the act has included public shaming of homosexuals and violent, violent assaults on their persons and on their property. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, as we know, insists that homosexual people must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. We can and we should call on St. Charles, St. Matthias, and their companions to intercede for the church and the civil government in their homeland, that through God's guidance, they may find ways to promote the gospel message of chastity without promoting discrimination, violence, and violation of human rights. Towards the end of October 1886, nearly five months since the execution at Namugongo, a Christian told Father Lordell that he had seen the remains of the execution pyre of Charles Luanga and that the martyr's charred bones remained there. A few days later, the relics were brought to the mission. They included the spine and several other bones. 
Later, the same people brought the rib bones of Matthias Kalemba, which were all that remained at the spot where he was tortured, dismembered, and left for dead. The precious remains of these two martyrs were all that could be positively identified. The mortal remains of the others were either burned completely to ash or scattered in various places. One of my most prized possessions is this reliquary, which contains tiny pieces of the bones of St. Charles Luanga and St. Matthias Kalemba. Perhaps a good way to conclude is to ask God's blessing through the intercession of the courageous martyrs of Uganda, our patron saints. Let's pray together. O God, who have made the blood of martyrs the seed of Christians, mercifully grant that the field which is your church, watered by the blood shed by St. Charles Luanga and his companions, may be fertile and always yield you an abundant harvest. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Through the intercession of St. Charles Luanga and St. Matthias Kalemba, May the blessing of Almighty God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come upon you now and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks very much. I don't know, do we have time for questions? Are there any questions about that? I'm not an expert, but I've read a lot. I'm not sure if you, you said this or not, but why is St. Charles Luanga the one that gets his name up there? In the That's a very good question. You know, I, I, I always said if, if I were ever in a small group of people and we all were martyrs together, it would be my lot to be one of the companions. You know, I'd, never, <laughs> I'd, I'd never get to be the marquee name. You know? they, they, have to pick, they have to pick somebody, you know, and it's usually one, sometimes two. Um, and if it's a large group of martyrs, and what, the, what the church will often do is, is choose people who had a special role, especially people who were native to a place rather than missionaries. You know. In this case, I think it's, uh, there's two things. One is that um, during the time that, that, the, that the fathers weren't there, and especially the time that the pages were, were contained in the, in the palace, Charles Luanga really did take a leadership role. He was only in his mid-20s at the time, but he was kind of a natural leader. Uh, and so he sustained their faith, and he baptized many of them. And all the way to Namagongo, he was talking to the, to the young ones, to the 14 and 16-year-old ones, and encouraging them and strengthening them in the faith. We heard what he said to them the night before they got called into the king's presence. If he tells you to abjure the faith, get behind me, and we'll all tell them we're Christians together. Another reason, I think, is because uh, he was set aside for uh, special uh, torture uh, and execution. Uh, the, the, the chief executioner kept Charles for himself. And so on a lot of the documentation of the canonization process, they go back and forth. Sometimes they mention Matthias first, and then Charles and companions. Sometimes it's just Charles, sometimes Charles, then Matthias, or Charles, then Joseph Mukasa. Uh, but he's the one that kind of really stood out in people's minds for, for his leadership in teaching the faith and also his encouragement of the other martyrs and the terrible torture that he endured himself. Good question. Thanks for asking. Father, thank you for all this information. I'm intrigued by some of the photographs. Uh -huh. uh, one is, tell us about the photographs. In particular, there was a group photograph with the quotation, very well, you put us to death. Right. So those were all of the... Um, all of the uh, pages who were uh, students, uh, catechumen students of the, of the king. I'm sorry, I was trying to get that, that photograph for you, and it's just gone, sorry. Um, they had all gathered with, with the king, uh, with the uh, students of the, the, the French missionaries, rather. They were servants of the king, and they went to the, to the missionaries together to be instructed. It's kind of neat uh, when you have um, martyrs from more modern times um, that we actually have photographs of them, you know. But uh, Charles Luanga is the top, so you have the two uh, fathers with the beards there, and then the road just immediately below them, uh, Charles Luanga is in the middle. Um, I have another version of the photograph with numbers with a key to who everybody else is, but I'm afraid I don't have it memorized. So you see some of them were extremely young. The first row, they can't be more than six or seven years old. Um, but they would have been kind of trainees in the court of the king, and they were all going to the fathers for, for, for catechesis. Um, not, all of the, uh, not all of the catechumens had been baptized before the persecutions began. And because, remember, because the, the palace had moved, 
to down by the lake, only a handful of, this, of the pages went with them. If the, the fire hadn't happened at the king's palace, uh, there probably would have been dozens more martyrs uh, because of that, that would have been kind of a full household contingent. Um, so anyway, these are many of the people that we're talking about uh, can be found in this photograph. Okay. Um, were there miracles associated with their, with their canonization, or were they automatically saints? Because so, so the beatification uh, happens um, once you can prove that the saints were, were the prospective saints were martyrs. So, once they took enough testimony uh, to um, to uh, find out that the uh, you know that it was not just a political thing that there was actual hatred of the faith involved and once they were able to determine exactly who died because they weren't necessarily keeping good paper records in the court at the time um, then they were able to proceed uh, with beatification they judged it to be a true martyrdom there's all sorts of conditions um, as far as a miracle for a canonization I don't have an answer. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know that. Uh, sometimes with a historical case like this, where it's a large group, um, they, don't, uh, they don't necessarily require miracles from every one of them. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that, other than, other than to explain how the beatification works. Is there anything known about what became of the king? <coughs> yeah, the king was deposed and spent about 20 years in exile. Um, he was eventually welcomed back after se several of his successors turned out to be even worse kings than he was. Um, but he didn't last too long after that. Um, he, he got into more conflicts with the British. By this time, Uganda was a British protectorate, and he was basically deposed again and, and just kind of died in exile and obscurity. I had a, uh, there was a priest that was with courage about 20 years ago. He passed away. Father Barry, and he um, uh, he really he gave me a, a novena, and to them, and there's a whole story about them, and the one that really impressed me was Saint Gonzaga. Is, is there anything in your research about that? Yeah, him? so one of them one of them was called Saint Gonzaga Gonza, right? Uh, they probably gave him the name after Saint Aloysius Gonzaga because it sounded like his name. That he he was a very um, uh, there was something about his, his death that was very um, uh, heroic. I don't know, something different. Yeah, uh, all of them I mean, in their own way, of course. Say that again. And they were being brought down the road to. Right. To so the on the road, on the road to Namagongo, um, as I said, they they would execute somebody right at the beginning, right, and then they would execute them at various crossroads along the way. And so Gonzaga, when he had been tied up the day before, he was, his arms uh, and, and his ankles were tied very, very tightly together. And the way that they would tie them up is they, they'd put the, um, put the ropes around and then put a piece of, the ropes kind of went through a piece of wood and they just tightened that as hard as they could. Well, he had been tied so tightly that overnight, in, uh, when they stopped for the night uh, before continuing the march, um, everything had just kind of swollen up. So when they started the march again, uh, uh, Gonzaga couldn't, could hardly move, you know? And so, you know, they were just gonna leave him by the side of the road and move on, and then they figure somebody else would come and bring him along later. Uh, well, he had a little bit of nerve, right? And uh, Gonzaga, and he wasn't more than, than uh, 20 years old, I think, uh, started yelling at the execution. He said, hey, they're all gonna get to be martyrs up there. You're not leaving me here. I know, you, I, I know you've got to, you're going to kill somebody at this crossroads, so it might as well be me. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not moving, he said. Do your worst. And they stabbed him, uh, hacked him to death, and then cut up his body. Uh, they were waiting for screams, and instead, I understand they said the, the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, that's not uncommon in, in the story of these martyrs, is that as they, um, as they went along, they, they would sing. Uh, they would pray together out loud, and even on the on, when they had constructed all these these uh, burning frames for execution, there were hardly any. There was no screaming. There's no shouting. Uh, there was, I mean, there were some uh, pagans who were who were burned along with them, and and those folks had a rather bad reaction. Um, but the the Christian martyrs uh, stayed very faithful and uh, and stayed calm and and cool through the whole thing. My first um, I. Uh they, they were selling a um, poster, and I have it hanging in my apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about this big. And it's uh, all the martyrs are on it. Right. And uh, I, I don't know if anybody can 
getting another one of that or anything. Yeah, I, I've been looking myself, to be honest with you, and uh, there's various uh, images of it online. You can see here, these are, are smaller pictures kind of cropped from the kind of poster that Jim's talking about. I know it's not exactly the one that you, that you mean, um, but what they do is they kind of line them up and all the guys on one side of the poster, uh, you can see have this kind of blue background with spears because they were all uh, speared and or knifed and or hacked to death. And then on the other side are all the ones who died by fire. Um, and that was, that was a, a little more than half of the 22 martyrs, I think 12 of them. Uh, died at uh, at Namagongo, uh, having been burned alive. Anybody else? Tom, all right. Hi. Before I read it, uh, it up. as they were being marched off, <clears throat> were they taken past the houses of the priests? So the houses of the priests. Thank you. The houses of the priests were in uh, in the capital, um, which was uh, some distance away. But when Father Lordell heard. Uh, that this was happening, he rushed down to Munyonyo, the, where the king's kind of summer palace was. Uh, and he, was he wasn't allowed in, but he was standing outside when they walked by. And, uh, and so they, they did pass him by, and they saw him there, and he was, he was half in tears. He was blessing them as they went by, and they were all smiling and said, we're going to be martyrs, Father, this is great. Did the priests stay there, or were they expelled from the country? The priests, no, they stayed. They, they didn't have an easy time of it with Mwanga. Um, but Moanga, his emotions, his moods were always kind of up and down. So, you know, Père Lordell went and confronted the king, and uh, he kind of backed off, you know, and the persecution stopped right away. Uh, he didn't, didn't order that those people not be executed, but, but um, you know, he, he cooled off, and he sent some gifts as if everything's all right, you know. And uh, so the fathers just kept doing their job, and, and inspired by the martyrs, lots and lots of people came. And they... Frankly, I think they really weren't too scared of the king anymore because you know they saw his own, the king's own reaction to what had happened, and they knew you know his anger is hiding his weakness. So so they went and, and they were they became Christians and, and the church grew very rapidly. I think there's one more back. Yeah. Many many decades ago, when I attended a Catholic high school, uh, uh, Catholic school, and they were uh, teaching a religion class. Describing the martyrdom of early Christians in Rome, and that to save themselves, all they had to do was deny their faith. They no, I'm not. And, and here we really see the same thing in this situation. And and I remember all the students being dumbfounded by that. So they said, Why didn't they just make up a white lie? Say, oh, no, 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 so difficult for us to conceive that that one would die uh, rather than than deny Christ. That's, 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 that's true in every age, which is why the martyrs are such, they're, they're right there at the top of the list of saints, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of comparisons to me with the Roman Empire uh, in, in this story. Uh, uh, the the kind of the kind of suspicion that grew in the heart of the king, uh, you know, through various things, including the tragedies that happened in in his own life in early 1886, the the just extreme cruelty. I mean, you read the lives of the saints, and and one of the things you notice is like how creative human beings can be, inflicting pain and humiliation on each other. Um, you know, so that's I mean, some of these these deaths were just every bit as brutal as as the Roman Empire. Uh, but then also, like you say, the um, how easy it would have been to go stand in that other group. And there were, I mean, among the pages, especially that, that May 25th when they were all going to be taken out, there were a handful of, of Christians or people kind of in, in training to be baptized uh, who did go with the king and, and did abjure the faith. Um, but they were certainly in the minority. Um, and it was, I think it was, you know, the, their, their own strong relationship with God and their strong relationship with one another. You know, they realized they had they were they formed a cohesive unit apart from distinct from the king you know they had a, a, a king in heaven you know and they were his his people they were his soldiers and so it inspired them with great courage to even make that ultimate sacrifice yes is there any information of the young men a little bit a little bit you know i think what happened was um, a lot of them were, lived apart from their families, 
uh, because they, they, they served full time in the palace and they lived there. Um, and so I think in, in some situations, their, their parents had never been evangelized. They weren't, they weren't on the road to being Christians. And when they heard about what happened, then a lot of them never became uh, Christians. Uh, but there are some stories of, of some of the, I think James uh, Buse Baleawo uh, was, um, uh, his mother eventually became a Catholic as well. And uh, lived, she lived well into her 90s, so that when they when they came back to kind of uh, to do the process again, get more details when the when the martyrs are going to be beatified, she was still alive, and uh, as well as a, a sister of another one of the martyrs, uh, and they were able to tell their their eyewitness accounts. Yeah, um, you saw me kind of struggle with that name. I, I do want to recognize our uh, our sign translator here, and we have a French translator over here who have been doing their best to keep up with the names of places and <laughs> saints. And uh, yeah. you know, I, I have them all in front of me typed out, and I struggle with them, so I, I'm really impressed. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, I have a question. Yes. What kind of recognition do they receive? So there are 14, at least, uh, martyrs uh, recorded at Namagongo, of whom, yeah, no, I think there may have been 19 total, and at least 14 of them have received uh, official recognition by the Anglican Church. Um, you know, the, in, in his homily for the canonization, uh, Pope Paul VI uh, made specific reference. He said, we mustn't forget the witness that was shown by members of the Anglican Church, but you know, because they're not part of the Catholic Church, we don't have any kind of authority to canonize them ourselves. But they do. I, I know on the um, one of the facades of, of Westminster Abbey um, in the last 15 years or so, they've they've installed all sorts of statues of the uh, of martyrs of the uh, of recent years, and I, I think at least one or two of the Anglican martyrs uh, from from Namagongo are, are depicted there. One more. Father John Harvey's ordination day is June 3rd. How about that? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Father John Harvey was ordained on the feast of these martyrs. So. Father John from Arizona. That's his day. There might be other priests who are ordained. <coughs> it's a good day. Yeah, absolutely. Good. So, I mean, that's, that's probably why they were close to his heart. And uh, we can be very grateful for his choice and, and the, the example of the martyrs that we have for, for our apostolate. So I have the reliquary here. If anybody would like to come up and, and uh, reverence it or look at it more closely, that's fine. Um, and then uh, Bill's going to give us some more instructions. Thanks so much. Thank you.